deep within the marbled halls of Candlekeep, the library fortress of the Sword Coast, and the legendary Knowledge Archive, where the greatest collection of writings in all Faerun are stored and curated, the renowned scholar Gry Lee Tomekeeper sat in his study, filled with a life's collection of ancient tomes and mysterious scrolls. A well-regarded sage and historian, Greiley had committed his entire life in the service of safekeeping and expanding the knowledge held within the cold, stone walls of this bastion of enlightenment. But one among his vast collection stood out, a large tome of unusual provenance. Bound in a thick, coarse hide and covered in infernal runes, the thick, fiendish tome was clearly ancient and certainly powerful, said to have been carried from the deepest pits of the Nine Hells by the Gold Elf Vampire and Hell Rider himself, Jander Sunstar. Greiley, a man of strong character and set principles, but also possessing a vast desire for knowledge, regarded the tome with an intoxicating mix of trepidation, fear, and excitement. For many months, Greiley studied the runes from a distance, waiting until his thirst for the forbidden secrets contained within overpowered his rationale for self-preservation. Finally, late one evening, under a pale, cold moonlight that filtered through the tall windows of his candle keep study, Greiley decided the time had come. He had prepared as best he could. He was ready. With a deep, quickened breath, his fingers traced the deep, rough grooves of the dark, grotesque runes as he whispered the infernal incantations he had studied silently in his own mind for so many nights. As he put voice to these unholy words, the tome began to glow, and faint cries of agony filled his mind. But he continued the incantation, his voice wavering ever so slightly. Then, just as the final syllable slipped from his lips, the air in the room grew dense and cold. The candles flickered, and an infernal dark energy pulsed from these ancient pages, bathing Greiley in a deeply haunting, diabolical light. Before he could utter another word, the ground beneath him trembled, and the room's shadows converged upon him as Greiley's world went black. He awoke to find himself on a barren battlefield under a blood-red sky where perpetual twilight reigned. This, a desperate and ravaged land, scarred from countless battles, he quickly recognized from his own historical books as Avernus, the first lair of the Nine Hells, where war raged incessantly and the swollen river Styx twisted like a bloated, blood-red serpent. He seemed to be floating, his form almost ethereal, yet he could feel the searing heat upon his delicate mortal skin as he was whisked away, not of his own volition. Next came Dis and the great iron tower, the very walls of which glowed with red-hot heat. Then a sinful garden and a prison of torment where cries of lust and agony could both be heard, blending into a cacophony of delight and desperation. It was all going so fast, impossibly so. Was this a dream? Greiley used all his will to concentrate, to remember these sights, these visions. Mineros, the endless fetid rain, a noxious swampland, and a city suspended by infernal chains. Fiery Phlegathos, a volcanic citadel, a vast pit of flames where even the devils cry out in searing pain from the hellfire. Moving rapidly from the burning heat searing his eyes to the bone-snapping chill of Stygia, a city of the dead, a citadel of ice, and an icy floating prison for a punished archduke. He shivered uncontrollably as he could feel the heartless cold upon his skin. Malbolge was next on this uncontrollable, hellish tour. The malefic horrors of toxic bile assaulted his nostrils, a fortress built from a gigantic skull, the seductive daughter of Asmodeus, an archduchess. Then Maladomini, an unholy carnival, and black, thick rivers of sludge. Cania, so desolate, so cold, unimaginably so. It was here Greiley nearly blacked out, but he persisted and caught a glimpse of a magnificent citadel 
atop a massive mountainous glacier. He concentrated with all of his might to keep focus and remain conscious, for he knew what came next. Nessus. Was this possible? Could this be real? He drifted across a landscape of blackened void, carved with endless deep chasms and ravines, crisscrossing the otherwise featureless landscape, except for Malsheen. Taking in the visual was hard to comprehend. Griley did not know how anything could be so big, a fortress of unimaginable size. He was awestruck and terrified. Then, suddenly, before he could even rationalize his fear or collect his thoughts, he stood, well, floated really, before the towering lord of the Nine Hells, Asmodeus. No longer certain if his mind was able to delineate from reality and nightmare, Griley tried to speak, but words would not form. It was all so surreal. The infernal deity in front of him, yet also all around him, imparted a sinister smile, and Griley was instantly entranced, mesmerized, unable to do anything other than focus on this radiant, godlike evil towering before him. Asmodeus spoke, a voice both melodious and menacing, resonating in and around him. Gryly Tome Keeper of Candlekeep, your reputation precedes you. I have admired your work from afar, a scholar of rare acumen, and an historian with a hunger for truth, however unpleasant it may be. No, oh, you are not dreaming, you stand in Nessus where the very beating heart of the Nine Hells engulfs you. Few mortals have laid their eyes upon this realm, and fewer still live to tell the tale. But do not fear much. You are my guest, however brief our visit. Understand, scholar, that this is not mere caprice on my part, nor is it an idle show of power. There is purpose to your presence here. You are here as witness to serve it, Supplicate and testify all you have seen and will see at my invitation. The grandeur and might of the Nine Hells, the master of its domain, and the steward of its purpose. But know this, scholar, my invitation is both an honor and a burden. Your world is teeming with tales of our realm, yet most only know shadows and whispers of its absolute truth. They fear the Inferno, they dread the torment, they tremble at the thought of eternal damnation, and rightfully so. Yet they are blind to the order, the hierarchy, the structure, the grand design of it all. And this is where you, scholar of Candlekeep, will unwaveringly serve my purpose. A tale needs a teller, a history, a historian. Through you I will shape this narrative to give your world a glimpse into the true splendor of Beator and its necessity along with its horrors. Not to sow fear, but to inspire understanding. Not to incite chaos, but to impose order. Remember this, power is not merely the ability to destroy or command. It is also the ability to create, to influence, to narrate. In your hands, I empower you with this narrative, revealing the need for consequence and the beauty of law. The mortal realm must understand that chaos must be purged, and that true glory lies in the absolute discipline and order of the cosmos. You are not just a witness to my domain, you are now its scribe. Return now to your mortal realm. I shall call upon you soon to observe all. I have to share. You will use your quill to etch these truths you will see into the minds of the material plane, to tell them not just of the horrors and torments of the Nine Hells, but also of its grandeur, its law, its purpose. You will recount the glory and power you have seen, and remember as you do so, you are not merely writing history, you are shaping it. With these words still echoing in his ears, Griley felt the cold, harsh reality of Candlekeep rush back to him. 
in an instant, Griley was back in Candlekeep, the weathered tome falling to the floor with a crash, a faint red glow fading from its pages as a sinister laugh echoed in his ears. He clutched his chest, trying to steady his pounding heart, yet the splendor of the nine hells, the task set upon him by Asmodeus, lingered in his mind, a story that needed, that must be told. His colleagues dismissed his tale as fevered imagination, a scholar's mind lost in the stories he had read. But Griley insisted it was real, the truth he was told, the horrors and wonders he had witnessed and felt. They were now forever engraved upon his mind as real as the ink-stained pages of his books. And so the legend goes that for the remainder of his life, Griley Tomekeeper wrote tirelessly and disappeared often, traveling to the Nine Hells or lost in his own delusions. Said to have personal invitation from the Lord of the Nine Hells himself, yet no record of these artifacts exists today. Griley Tomekeeper, the well-regarded sage and scholar of Candlekeep, a dedicated historian delivering the mysteries, terrors, and purpose of these nine hells from the very lips of the supreme devil Asmodeus onto the mortal realm, or a madman whose mind was broken and diseased. Griley believed these truths of what he had seen, do you? That choice is yours alone. These iconic tales presented to you in these volumes, whether accounts of experience and fact or the delusions of the deranged, are lifted from the very pages inked by the Candlekeep scribe of the damned, Griley Tomekeeper, so many centuries ago. It would be negligent to begin our journey without both discussing how the Nine Hells fits into the Dungeons & Dragons grand cosmology, while also acknowledging the myriad of conflicts and contradictions that exist across the various versions, game settings, and publications that form the vast knowledge base and repository that we draw so deeply from. Taking a few minutes in order to set up a clear framework in this regard, thus serving as a foundation for the entirety of this mega series and beyond, will serve us well throughout our journeys together. Let's first look at these incongruities with respect to the lore. It is simply an unmistakable and unavoidable fact that we will run into gaps, inconsistencies, and even flat out contradictory information, all published as canon at one time or another over the nearly half century that the game universe has existed. It would be impossible and therefore unreasonable to try and create some grand unification across all the various versions and settings associated with the Nine Hells or really any facet of the game's lore. However, while we will acknowledge and certainly discuss these rough spots, I'm of the mind that, strictly adhering to some arbitrary rule, a statement of fact in one sourcebook or another, or some specific facet of the lore that is associated with a singular version and or campaign setting, and thereby abandoning all else, that, in my opinion, leaves a lot of cool stuff, mostly lore, on the cutting room floor of the universe your world will exist in. And it is my belief that this should be avoided when and wherever possible. Let me share just one of the many examples that we're going to definitely run into countless times over the life of this series, and in doing so, share my own personal recommendations for your consideration regarding the best ways to address and mitigate these inconsistencies. There are clear gaps in the 5e source material where the information is not contradictory, but it's either completely omitted or only briefly alluded to. Let's take a look at one of my favorite infernal power groups outside of the Lord of the Nine, the Dark Eight, a group we will cover in depth a bit later in this series. This council of unique and named pit fiends are the de facto generals of the Blood War. While they most certainly take their orders from Asmodeus, and only Asmodeus by the way, they are a crucial element to the historic and ongoing lore and mechanics of the Blood War. Yet, if you're not a savvy veteran of the game or its lore, if you only read and follow official 5e source material on the subject of the Blood War, say Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, for example, 
you would be led to believe that the Lords of the Nine are the grand strategists of the most infamous and enduring war in all of Dungeons and Dragons history. And you would be dead wrong. In fact, in using 5e as your sole guide here, you very likely have zero knowledge that this historically important group even exists. Further, this omission has a terrible, even if unintended, ripple effect on the power dynamics, politics, interactions, and the overall hierarchy of the Nine Hells, especially for world builders, but also for your players, depriving them of these vastly complex and in-depth dynamics, should they venture and survive long enough in the Nine Hells. Because the 5e lore strongly implies that Asmodeus and his Archdukes have rolled up their proverbial sleeves and are entrenched into the daily planning of the Eternal Blood War, when in actuality, that is why the Dark Eight exist. And aside from the occasional meetings that the Dark Eight Council have with Asmodeus to provide war updates and gain approval for new offensives against the demons, the Archdevils have little interest and even less involvement in the Blood War, as they are far more concerned with their own internal machinations that exist within each of their domains and layers. Canonically, the Blood War is and always has been the purview of this important group of Pit Fiend War Generals, who are entrusted by Asmodeus and thus have near unlimited authority over the matters concerning this incredibly important facet of the game's lore. These Dark Eight prime subjects containing rich story and lore that you should be using and or creating with have all but vanished in the 5e source material. Now, did 5e do that on purpose? Did, did the writers actively seek to remove the Dark Eight and retcon the lore? You would be forgiven to think so, but in actuality, Chris Perkins, a D&D writer of some renown, has spoken openly about the Dark Eight, their presence, their role, and even his desire to add a new member to the 5e lore of the Dark Eight. I'll link a video in the comments if you're interested. It's from 2019 and still no Dark Eight editions that I have seen, so take that as you will. But it does confirm for me that this omission was not contradicted or retconned with the 5e source material, but more likely, they merely never got around to it. So what does this singular example and a sea of similar circumstance we'll run into mean for a gaming table playing in a 5e world as many of you likely are? Would you even know of the Dark Eight's existence if 5e was your sole resource? No, no, you would likely not. And further, does this mean that since 5e has no meaningful information on the Dark Eight that they should not be present in your world? Well, using the words made so famous by Carl Sagan and written by William Wright, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And this is a perfect example of why looking at all the lore across all the versions and settings will only enhance your world, your stories, and ultimately your enjoyment as a player, dungeon master, or world builder. Even if you count yourself as among the most restrictive by the book lore types, committed to confining your world to just the current lore of the version you have chosen, please understand that just because some facet of lore is not present or only mentioned in passing does not mean it's no longer canon. In fact, it may still be absolutely canon, as is the case with the Dark Eight in 5e. And to my way of thinking, situations like these, and there are plenty, mean you're not only free to use some or all of the previous edition's lore, which Let's be frank here, you could anyway, it's your table, but you should be encouraged to do so. You are enhancing and improving your world by its inclusion. The past editions of the game, particularly the second and third editions, are a vast ocean of amazing story and lore for characters, events, places, and the history of the game's universe. And while, yes, some of that content is in conflict and some has been retconned, but much of it has just been forgotten, waiting for a creative world builder who will take the time to find it. And that is at the core of why I'm creating this series, to help you in that discovery, if you're willing. Moving on to conflicts of the more cosmological in scale, the cosmology and the lore of the Dungeons & Dragons multiverse has no doubt seen much change throughout the various editions of the game, as well as by world settings, and this too has created slight to significant changes and interpretations of the lore in general and specific to our subject, the Nine Hells. Given the stated goal of this series to 
cover all the amazing planes of the multiverse, including these nine hells, a detailed discussion on the cosmological conflicts that exist across the many versions and campaign settings is important and definitely warranted. However, I think those details are best served in a separate video, a framework for all the planes of existence, and I've done that. If you've not already seen it, and if a detailed breakdown of the cosmology of Dungeons & Dragons interests you at all, I'd recommend watching that video for proper context. A link is below in the show notes and should be above you right now. With that said, to be very brief as it relates to this series, in case you are skipping that breakdown, of the three primary cosmological models that have been introduced into the game, those being the Great Wheel, along with the Planescape Great Wheel 2.0 update, the World Tree, and the World Axis. The Great Wheel is canon, certainly for me, and while 5e is only mostly back to the Great Wheel, all lore associated with any plane of existence coming from this channel will assume, unless specifically noted otherwise, to align to that model. And that is not necessarily meant as a singular endorsement. As I said, that's for you to decide, but it's simply to frame our journey and put it in the proper context as we go through all this amazing lore. Now that I have just successfully spoiled and boiled down my 18 minute video dedicated to the Grand Cosmology in about 30 seconds, if you want a deeper understanding of context and history of the multiverse in the Dungeons & Dragons game, you'll want to check that video out even if you do it later. So when all of this talk about conflicts and contradictions, if you only have one takeaway, let it be an awareness that is also my own guiding light for all the lore I produce, that there's good stuff. There's great stuff seated across all the variants, all the versions. Yes, even 4E. And it's my sincere hope for us to discover, pick, choose, heck, even create it together. The nine circles, the pit, the depths of depravity, the nine layers, Beator or simply hell. Many names, but they all mean the same thing. The ultimate plane of law and evil and the epitome of cruelty and discipline. Existing in the outer planes of the Great Wheel of Cosmology, the Nine Hells is arguably the worst place in all the multiverse. The Nine Hells is a fundamental plane of existence that lies between the infinite battlefields of the lawful evil, lawful neutral plane of Acheron and the bleak eternity of the lawful evil, neutral evil plane of Gehenna and represents a dark and dreadful location where infernal power and extreme malevolence hold sway. In the World Tree of Cosmology, 3rd edition, you'll find that Beator is located in the fiendish plane, while in the 4th edition, using the World Axis Cosmology, Hell is just floating adrift in the Astral Sea. Noted for its disciplined yet sinister and brutal nature, Beator is an unholy but highly ordered plane associated strongly with its lawful evil alignment and inhabited by the Batazu, the infernal fiends that you know as devils. It's a place where power and rule of law are taken to its extreme, with rules and regulations enforced with absolute precision, zero latitude, and utter cruelty. A meticulously structured place of overt manipulation, deceit, and treachery, it is here that the strong prey upon the weak, while a myriad of scheming, fiendish powers eternally wrestle for power and advancement, and do so at the cost of others. Each terrifying of these nine layers from the war-torn battlegrounds of Avernus to the endless depths of the canyons, chasms, and ravines of Nessus, each biome reflects a new and escalating form of suffering and agony dominated by the strict adherence to the lawful evil nature of its lord and master, Asmodeus. To say this place is a dangerous destination for any traveler or adventure is a monumental understatement, and it goes beyond just the supremely difficult encounters. In the Nine Hells, every aspect of the environment is hideous, hostile, and horrible, especially to those who are unprepared for its wicked and cruel nature. The Nine Hells exist as a testament to the grand design and purpose of the lawful evil ideology rather than a simple domain of torment and fear. It is a realm of absolute control where power is exercised not just through destruction but also through creation, influence, and narrative. To Asmodeus as the supreme lord of Beator, 
This infernal plane serves as his platform to inspire understanding of his sincere belief that only he can create a utopian universe, and doing so by imposing the ultimate of discipline and order amid a cosmos formed from chaos. Fiends, Devils, the Batazu. They go by many names, but whatever name you choose, they are the ultimate manifestation of the lawful evil ideology of their supreme ruler, Asmodeus, and are some of the most dynamic and versatile beings you'll find across the multiverse. These fiends lie in stark contrast to their sworn enemy, the chaotic evil demons of the abyss. While the demonic abyss may be infinite and full of terrifying chaotic beasts, all demons want to do is consume you, kill you. But the devils that rule Beator, they have a far grander, uh, more eternal plans for you. It's nothing but a forever of torment and servitude for those unfortunate petitioners, those lawful evil souls that find their way here. It simply cannot be overstated. These nine hells are not for every player, group, or even dungeon master. There are valid reasons why many players have never ventured here, and you would do well to know that your characters are far more likely to die here than anywhere on the material plane. Speaking as a dungeon master myself, one who has admittedly used my DM powers for good in helping my party out of deadly situations many times on the material plane, if my table decides to descend into the Nine Hells, they know what they've signed up for. That's just the reality of this iconic but deadly setting. And that is something dungeon masters should warn and players should consider before ever stepping beyond the proverbial fiery gates. Now that I have tried to convince the weak of will to stay away, for those players that are prepared, for those heroic characters that are ready to take on legendary challenges of extreme difficulty, these nine hells are a setting where you can tangibly and forever shape and transform the very world in which you play. Most devils are known for their cunning, manipulation, deceit, and certainly a lust for power. From the lowly petitioners to the mighty pit fiends and their arch devil lords, the hierarchy of the Batazu offer not only a rich variety of adversaries, but even potential, at least temporary, allies. Not a dynamic you're likely to find in the abyss. Beator serves as a prime setting for presenting and interacting with morally complex and ambiguous narratives that can challenge players in a myriad of ways that are not solved by might and magic alone. The complex hierarchies, alliances, and rivalries within their own ranks provide fertile ground to create amazingly intricate webs of interactions, manipulations, bargains, and power plays that can greatly impact the story and gameplay when properly utilized by a creative and forward-thinking dungeon or game master. The Arch Devils in particular stand as formidable figures of authority, power, and intelligence, and each of these Lords of the Nine, as well as a myriad of supporting, named and unique subordinate Lords, Dukes, and Generals, all with their own very unique and well-codified personalities, ambitions, and domains of influence can be parlayed and leveraged by smart, critical thinking players. And this allows world builders to create and players to grapple with temptations and consequences that present unique contemplations and multifaceted choices that are not always clearly defined as black or white when dealing with these infernal lands and their associated forces. While exploring these lawful evil lairs and confronting its inhabitants will certainly present formidable physical challenges, smart players will be even more mindful of the long-term dynamics of these interactions and their decisions that often have ripple effects that are not always clear and obvious at the outset. In fact, when delving into the Nine Hells, that is many times the best and sometimes the only way to survive. Something again, a wise dungeon master will impart onto their players long before they step a single boot into Avernus. As generally speaking, the strike first and ask questions later types they're not long for this world. Well, actually, they are, in fact, very long for this world, as a new petitioner soul, likely as a larvae or a lemure for the infernal army. Indeed, the infernal bargains and packs made within these depths offer players ample moral quandaries, where they must weigh potential benefits against the consequences of aligning themselves ever so briefly or making pacts or bargains with these lawful but ultimately evil forces. 
The Nine Hells presents, perhaps more than any other setting, a unique and deadly opportunity for players to explore the depths of their characters' virtues and vices, making choices that can shape their destiny, their soul, and maybe even the fate of the world around them. And that concludes Volume 1 of our iconic lore series on the Nine Hells. We got through all the important foundational information, so join us next for Volume 2, where we will dive deep into the myriad of origin stories for the creation of Asmodeus and his Nine Hells. I hope you had as much fun listening as I had creating and sharing. Please consider following on Twitter at Riches and Liches, checking out our Patreon, Discord, YouTube channel memberships for as little as two bucks, or a super thanks, the equivalent of buying that man a drink at the local tavern for a job well done. And if you feel like I earned it, sub and ring that bell to help me grow this amazing community. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.